Hello and welcome back to Columbia University Physics Preceptor TV. Uh, today we're going to talk about Lab 2.4. It's the ca capacitance lab. All right, so we're taught in physics that if you have an open circuit, a broken circuit, that the current goes to zero. So you'll see drawings like, you know, you have a battery, maybe you have a resistor here. And then instead of connecting over here, they're just open. And then people ask you, what's the current in the circuit? And you say the current is zero. And now, just because it's an open circuit like this doesn't mean that the current has to be zero. What it means is basically that no, no charge can move from one end to the other end. But if you're smart enough that you put large plates in between here, uh, it might actually take a while for the circuit to realize that the circuit's actually broken. So an electron would come here and it would um, enter this first plate. And instead of stopping, it would kind of flow out on the, on the ends and uh, fill up this capacitor. So this is what a capacitor is. So it is basically a broken circuit. Um, but the circuit doesn't realize that at first. So what you'd expect is that as soon as you start, the circuit doesn't know that this thing is here. It just pretends like there is a continuous flow of charges here. So you'd expect to see the exact same circuit as if you didn't have the capacitor there at all. However, for a long time, you can imagine that these plates start filling up. And since the battery basically pulls charges from one end and pull, puts them on the other side, it can only keep doing so until um, the potential difference across this capacitor uh, is less or until it's equal to the battery potential itself. Afterwards, it can't lift it from one end to the other end. So then you'd expect that the current would asymptotically go to zero as uh, time increases. So if you draw the current for this, for this, um, this uh, circuit here, you'd expect it to start out somewhere here, which would be the equivalent if this has a potential V, and this is a resistance R, you'd expect it to be V over R originally, and then simply die out to zero as time progresses. When you, when you have very small capacitor plates or no capacitor plates at all, basically what happens is that this dies out so quickly that everyone says that the current's always zero. But in all reality, it dies down, it turns out to die down exponentially. So let's get, uh, let's show that this in fact it dies down exponentially because it becomes important. That's what we're going to try to verify today. Um, first of all, let's, let's suppose that we don't have a battery. Suppose that we somehow manage to charge a capacitor. Put some positive charge Q on this side and some negative charge Q on the other side. And suppose we have a resistor. And suppose we have some, um, some possibility of opening the circuit so that there's no current flowing. Now, as soon as we close this, the charges are going to want to fall through to the other side. So they're going to try to equalize themselves. Now, in fact, since, as you're remembering from class, the potential um, across this capacitor is equal to the charge divided by the capacitance. So this is your potential for the capacitor. Now, of course, when there's some current flowing here, some current I, there's going to be a potential drop over the resistor too. So VR is equal to the current, let's call it capital I times the resistance. And from the loop rule, we see that this su the sum of these two has to equal zero, so that um, the current times the re um, uh, resistance plus Q over C has to equal zero. Now, this can in fact be turned into a differential equation by noticing that the current I, in fact, is nothing else but the time derivative of this charge Q. So it can replace this here by the time derivative of the charge. And this differential equation has a specific solution. Um, the solution for this is Q is equal to the initial Q that you stored on these plates. So I guess let's call these Q0 times E to the minus T over RC. So as you see that the charge actually dies out exponentially. As you'd expect, you'd expect them to start at Q's of zero when T is equal to zero. And as T goes to plus infinity, you see this right-hand side dies off to zero, which is exactly what you'd expect. You'd expect all of the charges to equalize. Um, now, since we're interested in the current in this lab, we're going to actually take the time derivative of both sides. And we're going to see that the current is equal to the original current, I sub zero, also times this exponential. And this is, in fact, what we're going to measure. And from measuring what the current, how the current behaves, we're going to try to determine R times C, the resistance times the capacitance, or also known as, which is also known as the time constant for the circuit, because it occurs together with the time and the exponent. 
Now that's for a discharging uh, capacitor. Now what happens in the, in the charging case like we had previously? Well, we have some um, EMF here, still the resistance. So everything looks pretty much pretty similar except for the fact that this thing doesn't have any charge on it originally. It's uncharged. Instead of over here we had some r r uh, initial charge on it. And also now we've introduced a battery of EMF E. Over here we had no battery. So it's discharging and this one becomes charging. Now from the loop rule again we see that there's really no difference except for the fact that the right hand side instead of being zero is going to be equal to this EMF. So the QDT like we had before over here times R plus Q over C instead of it being equal to zero is now equal to this EMF. And what we can do is we can take a second time derivative of both sides and basically here instead of getting the first derivative you get the second derivative of charge which is basically the derivative of the current. And then here instead of the charge Q we just get the current. And the, since E is a constant voltage source the time derivative is zero. And then this is another differential equation which we can also solve and it turns out to have the exact same solution. They both admit the same solution, the same dying exponential. And that's exactly what you'd expect too. Like we mentioned in originally, originally the, the current in the circuit should start out as if this capacitor wasn't there. And eventually, asymptotically, it should die down to zero. That's exactly what this equation suggests. suggests. So let's go on to, uh, so this is basically the physics behind the lab. Let's go on and discuss something called semi-log paper. When we, um, when we graph this later on, we're eventually going to graph the current as a function of time. Now because it's dynamic exponential, we're going to get a graph that looks something like that. But to the untrained eye or to anyone who's, who looks at a graph like this, it's nearly impossible to determine if this is in fact y is equal to e to the minus x or if it's y is equal to e to the minus 1.1x or even if it's y is equal to 1 over x or 1 over x squared. They all look very similar. So it's very difficult for us to determine exactly what the relationship is, not just what the exponent is, but in fact if it's even exponential decay at all. So the trick then is to instead of graphing y versus x like we've done here, so let's put an x here and a y, instead of doing that we're going to graph a log y versus x. Now if y is equal to e to the minus x, that means that log y um, is equal to negative x times log e. Now in this lab, in the, the, we're going to use log base 10, so that's why this doesn't just equal 1. So it's log base 10 of y and log base 10 of e. And if we, if we were to graph instead of y versus x like we did over here, if we graph log y versus x, we see that this is just a regular straight line. It has a zero intercept and a negative, um, negative slope, which is equal to negative log base 10 of e. Now in this case we could definitely tell a difference between these two because uh, um, the slope will be slightly different. Also we could definitely tell a difference between these sec last two and the first two because these wouldn't become straight lines at all. They would be something totally different. So this provides us with a really neat tool to be able to determine if this uh, relationship is exponential as we claim and not only that but exactly which parameters enter into the relationship. Let's see. Now, of course, in our example, we don't have y's and x's. We have current and time. So let's figure out how, what this would look like for our specific example. The current as a function of time was claimed to be equal to the initial current I0 times e to the minus t over RC. Now, if we take, instead of graphing I versus t, if we graph log I versus t, we have to take the log of this ex expression first. So we get log base 10 of the current is equal to, and on this side we have the product of two expressions. Now the log of a product is the same as the sum of the logs, so this becomes log base 10 of the current I0 plus the log of the secondary expression. Now for those familiar with logs, when you take the log of an exponential you can bring down the exponent in front and simply just take the log of the, of the um, of this, in this case E. So this becomes minus T over RC times log base 10 of E. 
So now we see that instead of graphing i versus t, if we graph log i versus t, this becomes a regular straight line. It has some intercept over here, and it has some slope, which is dictated by these numbers, negative slope. So rather than looking like a complicated ex uh, dying exponential, it's simply going to be a straight line with negative slope. The intercept here is going to be log base 10 of i naught, and the slope is going to be equal to minus log base 10 of e divided by rc. So simply by measuring the, the slope of the line, we can discover what the constant rc is, which is the ultimate goal of our, of our lab. Now, of course, if you take many da data points, taking the log of each data point might be slightly um, you know, boring. You might, might take a while and it leaves room for a lot of mistakes. So someone invented um, semi-log paper, which does the job for you. Suppose that we wanted to graph the points 0, 1, 1, 10, 2, 100. Well, on a regular piece of paper, without semi-log or without taking logs at all, 0 would correspond to 1, 1 would correspond to 10, so somewhere up here, and 2 would correspond to 100, very far up. And what you see is you get this if you continue with more points, you see that you get some type of, of exponential increase. Now, instead of doing that, we already said that we're supposed to take the log of these values. So instead of graphing, we still have 0, 1, and 2 because we don't take the log of the x value. We only take the log of the y value. Now, the log base 10 of 1 is just simply 0. The log base 10 of 10 is simply 1. And the log base 10 of 100 is 2. So by taking the log of each value, we get, lo and behold, the same straight line we were talking about before. So it goes through all these data points. Now, what, like I said, instead of taking the log, we're going to use semi-log paper. And basically, semi-log paper just does the job for you. It keeps these 0, 1, 2 down here, but instead of marking these off as 0, 1, and 2, it marks it off as 1, 10, and 100. So you don't even have to take the log. You can just read off what your value is. It's 100. And you go and look on the list where 100 is. And huh, that must be where I should put my, put my data points. So it does it for you. The only thing is that when you later compute the slope of this, you can't simply take rise over run like you did before. Suppose we have these two points here. Well, this difference is definitely 1. So 2 minus 1 is 1. But you can't simply take 100 minus 10 anymore, because that's 90. And the slope is definitely not uh, 90 in this case. Instead, when we actually compute the, the, the slope, we have to take the log of the y values. So what we really should do when we compute the slope is take the change not of y, but change of log y divided by the change of x. Or in our case, we should take the change in log of the current divided by the change in time. And this should be the slope in our case. So now let's go get to the actual experiment. There are going to be three parts to the experiment. One's going to be a charging capacitor, one's going to be discharging, and then one's going to be a little neat application at the end. So let's see here. By the way, you have a voltage source that has both the 15 volts and the 300 volts options. Make sure that for the first two experiments you use the 15 volts, because if you use the 300 volts, um, well, that could break the circuit and you could get hurt, so. So, we have a capacitor down here, C, and what we're going to do is we're going to start by discharging the capacitor. I think this is the first part. Yeah. Discharging the capacitor. This here is going to be some small resistance. And we're going to discharge it. So it's going to start out completely discharged. Then we're going to move this over, this uh, switch, over to the other side. And when we do that, it's going to start charging. Because there's a battery of 15 volts over here, it's going to start charging through this um, circuit here. And we're going to be able to measure the current as a function of time. Now in this circuit, we have the EMF, E, uh, the resistance R, and the capacitance C. So the current should decrease, as like we said before, 
as this exponential e to the minus t over rc. And by then graphing on this semi-log paper the current as a function of time, we will be able to deduce what r times c is. Now the second part of the experiment is pretty much the same thing, but we're going to put the uh, ammeter on the other end. Um, let's see here, yes. And we're going to start by ch charging this capacitor up using this battery and then simply flip one switch charge, which will happen in just a few seconds or a second if less, if even less. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to move the switch over to the other side and then we're going to let it discharge. This time we're not going to have a small resistance over here. We're going to let it discharge through uh, this uh, ammeter over here. And we're going to be able to, again, measure the current as a function of time. And again, deduce what this constant R times C is. For the final experiment, we're going to switch this voltage source instead of to the 15 volts, to the 300 volts. This over here on the, on the right is a neon bulb. And here we have a resistance and a capacitor. Now a neon bulb works, works in such a way that unless you apply a very large potential across it, it's going to just act like an open circuit. However, at a certain breaking voltage, this thing is going to admit a current through it and it's going to light up. Now the way it works here is we have this 300 volt source providing current, providing voltage through the circuit. So when we close this, um, uh, the switch up here, we're going to start charging the capacitor. Now eventually this is going to produce such a large voltage that the voltage over this neon bulb is going to become sufficiently large that the capacitor is going to discharge through this neon bulb. Now of course when that happens, the voltage across this capacitor is going to decrease because there's not enough charge stored anymore. So at a certain point, this is not going to let any more uh, current through and it's going to stop. It's not going to be lit up anymore. Then again, this is going to keep um, charging this capacitor up until again we reach a critical point where this potential is large enough to discharge through the neon bulb. And this is going to keep happening, so what you're going to see is this neon bulb flickering. And of course, since R and C here det determine the overall um, time constant for the circuit, we are going to see this flicker at, ver at, at different periods depending on how we choose R and C. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to vary R and C and show that this, the, the period of flickering over here depends on it. And that's pretty much the lab today, so good luck and have fun.